From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Friday, May 17th. I'm Abby Larico. The 10th anniversary of the police shooting of Michael Brown Jr. is approaching in August. A civil rights attorney says people must vote to push lawmakers to pass a federal police reform law that could help stop black people from dying at the hands of police. There are a lot of people who want to articulate that the criminal justice system is broken, and it's not. Systems in this country are broken. They work as intended. We have to deconstruct those systems and reimagine them so that they look like us. Bakari Sellers, an attorney and former South Carolina state representative, talks about ways to implement police reform, coming up on The Gateway. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones has officially launched her re-election campaign. She formally announced she's running for a second term in a room full of supporters last night. After serving in the Missouri House of Representatives and as city treasurer, Jones has been in the mayor's office since 2021. She's the first black woman to hold the job and the first candidate to begin an official campaign for the 2025 mayoral race. The Democratic primary election is next March. The effort to make the Missouri Constitution more difficult to amend suffered a possibly fatal blow Thursday. St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum has more on the potential demise of the GOP priority. House Republicans declined to go to conference on a measure that would require a constitutional amendment to be approved in five out of eight congressional districts. That means the House GOP wants the Senate to vote on a version that includes other provisions, including a ban on non-citizens from voting, which is already illegal in Missouri. Democratic State Representative David Tyson Smith of Columbia says it's exceedingly unlikely the Senate will do that before 6 p.m. on Friday. And I think they're in a rock, between a rock and a hard place, but yeah, that may be that may be the end of this. If the effort to boost the constitutional threshold doesn't pass, it will mark one of the rare times where Missouri Democrats stopped a key GOP priority from passing. In Jefferson City, I'm Jason Merzenbaum, St. Louis Public Radio. The Missouri legislature has passed a bill that bans municipalities and other local governments from creating and enforcing any eviction moratoriums unless authorized by state law. Members of the House of Representatives voted 145 to 1 yesterday to pass the legislation. Because it has already gone through the Senate, the bill now goes to Governor Mike Parson. Representative Jamie Johnson says while she personally dislikes the policy, she has heard from several of her constituents who are landlords and are asking for the bill. I do understand their plight. I do understand what they went through during COVID and how scary it was for them as investors. So I will be supporting this policy. The measure is just one of many included within the legislation dealing with property and property rights. St. Louis Circuit Attorney Gabe Gore says his office will review a 1988 rape conviction for which a man is serving life in prison. Advocates for Frederico Low Bay say the same officers who investigated the rape had previously filed trumped-up drug charges against him. They also say independent DNA testing excludes him as the rapist. And they say that Low Bay does not match the description provided by the victim, who has since died. The review could lead Gore to file a motion to vacate Low Bay's conviction. That would require a hearing in front of a judge. Pharmacists and patient right advocates plan to protest Express Scripts business practices today outside the company's headquarters in North St. Louis County. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenton reports demonstrators say the company's negotiating tactics result in decreased availability of medicines and higher prices. Express Scripts is a pharmacy benefits manager, an intermediary between pharmacies and insurance companies. The company can determine which medicines are available with insurance plans and help set co-pays. Loretta Bozing of St. Francis County is the founder of Unite for Safe Medications and an organizer of the protest. She says Express Scripts and other companies negotiate drug prices, but don't pass those savings to pharmacies and patients. She says companies limit availability of prescriptions by funneling patients to their own pharmacies. We want to save local pharmacies and ensure patients have options to use their local pharmacies as well. Express Scripts representatives say most prescriptions in the country are filled through retail and chain outlets. I'm Sarah Fenton, St. Louis Public Radio. Counter Public, a nonprofit dedicated to public art, is placing what it calls erased history markers at 11 St. Louis intersections, where streets named for Native peoples meet streets named for places where white settlers displaced them. Intersections include Cherokee Street and Tennessee Avenue, Potomac and Virginia, and Osage and Missouri. Homeowner Jesse Martinez allowed a sign on her property near one intersection. I would love for the people who are walking 
to read the sign, realize the history that's on this land, and that somehow makes them more involved in the community that is here. Counter Public is also raising money to help the Osage Nation buy Sugarloaf Mound, the oldest human-made structure in what is now St. Louis. North St. Louis residents will be able to discuss the future of their community during training sessions hosted by the Contemporary Art Museum. St. Louis Public Radio's Lauren Brennicky reports the project could inform revitalization efforts. The Contemporary Art Museum will use a $65,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to pay for the community building initiative. The museum will work with the St. Louis Planning and Urban Design Agency's Cultural Resources Office to offer the training. Lucas Rugley is founder of Love for the Lou, a community development organization in North St. Louis. He says the initiative could allow North St. Louis residents to help the area grow. I think bringing in resources to North City is great, um, and especially with uh, creative expression because it's a way for uh, neighbors and organizations to cast vision uh, in a really clear way. The initiative will continue for two years. I'm Lauren Brennicky, St. Louis Public Radio. As the 10-year anniversary of the police shooting of Michael Brown Jr. approaches, questions remain around police reform at the federal and local levels, as people ask why African Americans continue to die at the hands of police. Civil rights attorney Bakari Sellers says national police reform is dead and people must vote to start over. St. Louis Public Radio's Andrea Henderson recently spoke with Sellers while he was in town promoting his new book on national politics. She asked Sellers about the difference between protests for George Floyd in Minneapolis and Brown in Ferguson. I think the first thing is Danella Frazier. Um, she was the young 17-year-old girl who had the audacity to film. It was uh, the words of George echoing out for his mother. It was that imagery of a knee on the neck. And then last but not least, COVID is one of the largest reasons that the response to George Floyd was what it was, because people couldn't turn away. And you saw the protests that were more diverse than what they were in Ferguson. But again, you have to realize that Michael Brown did not die in vain, because if we did not learn those lessons, if we did not take back that power in 2014, then I'm not sure we would have been able to do the same in 2020. I know many people thought after Mike Brown's death that we would see this reckoning for federal police reform. Did you think that would happen? And did you feel like we were on the cusp of change for the black community? I did believe we were on the cusp for change after George Floyd, but not after Michael Brown. There was no impetus to move. That's unfortunate um, because I think that there should have been a greater response to Michael Brown's death. And I think that if the Missouri state legislature or the federal government um, would have responded appropriately, maybe you wouldn't have had George Floyd. What types of things do you feel like they should have done, whether it was the Missouri legislative or the federal government? I mean, there are a lot of things in my book. I've outlined some of the things you can do along the lines of policing, um, banning chokeholds, a database for bad officers. So no longer can you get fired from the Clayton Police Department and go down and work in the, you know, St. Louis or Ferguson Police Department. And so there are a lot of things that we can do. And the problem is that those things still have not been done on a large scale. What do you think needs to happen on both the left and the right to be able to bring about this federal police reform? Unfortunately, it's dead. I mean, we, you know, I actually sat in a room with Ben Crump. I sat in a room with the families of of victims of police violence. Uh, Tim Scott was there, and so was Lindsey Graham. And, you know, we even just tried to codify what Donald Trump did on criminal justice, and they refused to. The police unions won. And there's an unwillingness to do what's right by the people of this country. And that's unfortunate. So where does that leave the people? Um, Having to utilize our voice, elect better people to Congress, start over, try again, but keep pushing. Mm. So after Ferguson protests, many folks thought police reform legislation would naturally occur. In Missouri and the St. Louis area, it did in some ways. We saw elections of local and state officials and lawmakers. However, police reforms have kind of stalled. Why do you see that? First, we have to reframe our thought. There are a lot of people who want to articulate that the criminal justice system is broken, and it's not. Systems in this country are broken. They work as intended. We have to deconstruct those systems and reimagine them so that they look like us. And um, it takes people like those individuals who won those races, those district attorneys, those local mayors. You know, it takes Mayor Jones and many others to be within these systems and try to peel back the layers of of decades of challenges to African Americans. And it's hard to do that in four years. I mean, it's hard to do that in eight years.
There are too many black people killed by the police in the past few years to even remember every name, (laughs) every year, every instance. One would think that over the years of continued police brutality toward black people that happen to be captured on social media, that black people will feel some type of reprieve from police brutality. Why do we still have these moments? Well, we have one level of accountability. That was uh, only in George Floyd, but it took so much for us to get that accountability. We just haven't fundamentally done anything to change the value of black lives in this country. And so when you don't see the humanity in individuals, when you're able to see them as less than, you're able to treat them anyway. And so I find hope in this new generation. I find hope in my children. It's hard, but you have to be willing to cling on to some hope. That was civil rights attorney Bakari Sellers speaking with St. Louis Public Radio's Andrea Henderson. His new book is The Moment, thoughts on the race reckoning that wasn't and how we can all move forward now. Our Brian Moline edited that piece. The Gateway is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Abby Larico, and from the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Have a safe and happy weekend.